I'm Captain Kirk. Fascinating. Hello! I'm a doctor, not a mechanic. Thank you, thank you. Love you. Mwah. Most illogical. I saw. Well, that was different. Yep, rousy, but different. Places, please. And here we go. Welcome, ladies, gentlemen, Ioceans, chickens and things to episode Ooh, 46 of the Muppet Trek podcast. I'm Jarman. And I'm Steve. We're here, as always, to compare, contrast and confer about our two favorite franchises. Jarman, what are those? Those are the Muppets and Star Trek. And oh, yeah. We, yeah, we do one to one reviews of the Muppet Show and Star Trek, the original series. And this week we have special Muppet Show guest J.P. Morgan and the original series episode, A Piece of the Action. Yeah, and apparently not that J.P. Morgan, but a different one that no one's heard of. Who is this and person? not the other J.P. that's also in this episode. That's right. <laughs> well, J.P. Morgan um, was an American singer. She was popular through the 50s and 60s, doing a lot of big covers of standards. Um, her biggest ones being Just a Gigolo, Mutual Admiration Society, and Are You Lonesome Tonight? In the 70s, she mostly became known as a popular guest on shows like The Gong Show and The Muppet Show. Like, you know, one of these people that's famous for being famous. Hollywood Squares. Uh, so this episode was filmed at at the end of November mm -hmm. in 1977. And just a few months later, she was on the gong show uh, at a live taping and flashed her breasts oh. and got kicked off the gong show. And her career never recovered. Oh, my gosh. She did it on purpose. She was apparently always known as kind of a little bit more gruff and open and scandalous. And you get a little bit of that in this episode mm. with their treatment of her. Um, but she just kind of took it to a different level and no one wanted her around anymore because no one could trust her not to show her breasts on television, man. Um, so this is, we're really like at the very end of the height of her career with this episode. I will say this is two episodes of the Muppet Trek in a row where we have uh, female guest stars who are later on known for nudity. That's right. <laughs> um, but what does our audience know her from? This is legitimately the first guest celebrity that I can confidently say probably nothing. <laughs> That's sad, but true. Before this point, you maybe heard a story about some host of the gong show who got kicked off. Uh, some guest got kicked off for, for going topless. That is the only reason you would know who she is. Wow. Like if you ever heard that story, but that's it. Poor J.P. Morgan. Spelled Poor J.P. Morgan. But this week on The Muppet Show, uh, backstage, the B plot kind of sucks. Um, because it shows up too late, but the people that shows up too late is that Scooter's uncle, who's also named JP, is there. Kermit does not like that JP, but there's a lot of confusion between which JP he is talking about at any given moment. Mm -hmm. And it causes Scooter's uncle to think he's going to perform and JP Morgan to think that Kermit hates her. <laughs> but it shows up in like the last five or six minutes of the show, so it doesn't matter. Right. <laughs> <laughs> On stage, though, Kermit introduces uh, J.P. Morgan, who comes out to sing Tweedly D, dressed as a big flamboyant bird. She sings a lively tune. It's kind of cute. Up next, we get the Swedish chef trying to open a coconut. He tries various implements, and I'm not going to lie. That saw was very real and made me very nervous. <laughs> Hands that can't see what they're doing. <laughs> oh, my God. He finally opens it up, and there's a bomb inside of it, which blows up. <laughs> there's a lot of bombs this week for, like, no real reason. <laughs> it's great. Following this, we get Rolf, Gonzo, and Animal performing Flight of the Bumblebee, but really Rolf and Gonzo are performing while Animal chases an animated bee, he's trying to hit it with a club. It ends up hurting two of his like, co-workers with a club. <laughs> mm -hmm. Up next, we get a more and more rare at the dance. Most of the jokes this week center around the difference between men and women. Mm -hmm. Afterwards, we get a real performance uh, uh, from Rolf um, and Fozzie, which is rare. Like super rare to see these two kind of together because they're both double arm puppets. Right. Um, but then they both play the piano and it's a shock that Fozzie knows how to play the piano. And I think they missed a really good opportunity for a joke here where they finish the song and Ralph turns to Fozzie and says, man, you should do this professionally. This is what you're actually really good at. He's like, are you kidding me? I'm really good at comedy. <laughs> and then just <laughs> be like, he's missing his calling entirely, which is pretty funny. Uh -huh. So they do a nice little duet uh, of a song called The English Country Garden. 
Mm-hmm. We finally get a talk spot, which like the at the dance is becoming more and more rare. Kermit and Jay talk about uh, the rough time she's having on the show. And then Kermit explodes and then her ridiculous hat explodes. And then they both explode off of the talk spot. Mm-hmm. It's weird. It's fun camera tricks, but it's weird. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, next, we have a strange performance with Floyd and Nigel, the band leader, Floyd playing upright bass and Nigel whistling. And it's a fun little number. Following this is pigs in space where the swine trek is plummeting towards earth. They've got to kick. They've got to boot someone off. Uh, Link hog throb and uh, Julia strange pork decide piggy's the one to go. Uh, strange pork accidentally gets ejected into space. Hog throb tries to eject piggy who catches him and then beats him mercilessly. <laughs> uh, Muppet news flash. He gets hit by a grand piano. Mm-hmm. It's probably the biggest thing we've seen dropped on that guy. Yeah, because the uh, London Orchestra had to get rid of weight of their plane in space, carrying on the theme of having to get rid of weight for a, a flying object, and the piano falls. See, I thought I thought the better joke would have been Julia Strange Pork. Oh, that would have been better. Right yeah. after, it would have been the better joke. I don't know. They missed it. <laughs> they missed two jokes tonight. Uh, we then get a PSA from Sam the Eagle about the importance of vigilance against crime and theft as everything behind him is stolen by thieves. <laughs> Finally, JP comes out and sings that old black magic, a lively number where she sings with Dr. Teeth and performs with the electric mayhem. It's a great number. It really is. Uh, Kermit thanks JP. Uncle JP comes out thinking he's going to sing a song. Kermit tries to cut him off. And that is what we call the Muppet show. Woohoo! Jarman, what did you think of this week's episode of the Muppet show with special guest JP Morgan? So, you know, I think this is continuing my trend of guests that I've never heard of being better than some of the most famous guests. Like um, last week we re- reviewed um, uh, Bob Hope and it was a very middling slash meh episode. And then now we have JP Morgan, who I thought was funny. She was good with the Muppets. She was a really good singer. Um, the rapport she had where she was kind of being really kind of dis- dissing the show a bunch and saying she didn't want to be here and she's having a bad time was funny. She sold it. She wasn't, it wasn't like she just really didn't want to be there like Bob Hope. Um, so <laughs> she was, and her singing was so good. And uh, I really actually kind of enjoyed the bombs going off all throughout the episode. They even blew up Statler and Waldorf. Yeah. Um, so I, I like it's had a strange uh, lackluster through line, but the through line was still pretty funny of the bombs. And then the JP gross thing, because they didn't address the fact that they had JP gross and a JP Morgan in the same episode, that would have been uh, terrible. So I'm glad they addressed it. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, actually I enjoyed this an upper middle episode for me. Cause it was just fun, enjoyable and solid. Yeah, I agree with some of your points. I do think she did well with the Muppets. Uh, it was fun to see finally a talk spot. Cause we don't get those anymore. Yeah. Which is direct one-on-one interactions. That also was fun. Um, some of the musical numbers were really good. The duet with Fozzie and Rolf, um, old black magic, uh, even Twill DD was not bad, but for whatever reason, this didn't it. None of it came out into like a collective good episode for me. Mm. And I, I wish I could identify why, because I'm naming all these great things. But for whatever reason, I just have a really bad taste in my mouth about this episode. There was no, I guess, standout moments um, where everything was just kind of generally kind of solid, but not like nothing jumping out of me like, wow, that was great or that was hilarious or that kind of thing. So I can see that. True. Um, but that being said, like that old black magic is such a classic. And that's actually, they mentioned Tweedledee D, which they did for the first time, what, 21 years ago or something like that on, I believe salmon friends, that old black magic is also a number they did on salmon friends. Oh, gotcha. uh, Jim's original show on public access way, way back. That's crazy. Um, and so that even that's a fun, a fun playback. Um, but yeah, I don't, I, I wish I couldn't, I could nail it as to why this didn't hit. And I think maybe it was the backstage plot. Yeah. wasn't substantial I wish enough. They would have kept the explosions throughout. Like crazy. Harry is on the loose setting up explosions could have been enough B plot, but then two thirds of the way through, they're like, Oh crap. Someone forgot about JP gross. We got to write a joke about this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Whereas the entire backstage, I think could have been the JP gross joke. Yeah. Continually confusing them. And yeah, where JP, Here's Kermit talking about JP gross at the beginning and spends the rest of the episode mad at him. And he doesn't know why. 
Or like somebody thinks the whole time that they're making JP Gross the host when like it's they're like upset. Why is JP Gross hosting? It should be someone else, and that's really JP Morgan. Or oh, something or like or yeah, uh, or you know, JP thinks he's hosting because they announced it, and so they have to like trick him into thinking he's doing it. Oh, and he's doing his own show, but it's just for the rats or something. <laughs> right, right, right. Like I, I just it was it was a good concept, and it was a rare thing to have two people named JP and the name mix up, but they could have played it. But they didn't. They just made like a two step joke out of it. And to be the funny thing being that J.P. Gross is supposed to mean J.P. Morgan. He's kind of based off of J.P. Morgan. And yeah. then she's for some reason changed her name to J.P. Morgan or J.P. Morgan. So that just goes right along with each other. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. Some good moments, some really good interactions between the host and the Muppets, some good music. But for whatever reason, for me, it didn't add up. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Uh, music this week. Uh, Tweedledee. Dee. Uh, wit- written by Winfield Scott and recorded by Laverne Baker first. This is Miss Baker's first big hit, but she didn't get the recognition she deserved. At the time, the rights for copyright protections around arrangements aren't what they were today. So there was this other record company called Mercury Record who was larger and served a very white audience mm. and had bigger distributions. So they just ha- took the exact same arrangement and had it recorded by a white lady named uh, Georgia Gibbs and re-released it. Oh, geez. <laughs> and it made it even bigger. Like that happened a lot in those days. Yeah. The, the, just the protections weren't there. The, they're there now. Uh, Flight of the Bumblebee by Russian composer Nikolai Rimsky Korsakov. He was part of a group of composers known simply as the Five. Oh. They were all self-taught Russian composers that were all very young and made a like joint and concerted effort to define what Russian music should sound like. Hmm. So yeah, they're known as the Five. English Country Garden. While about an English Country Garden, the most popular version of this song was recorded by an American singer actor named Jimmy Rogers. If you look on Jimmy Rogers' Wikipedia page, you know they have all the sections and the headers. The, the two that were in a row that caught my eye was head injuries and lawsuits. Oh no! <laughs> okay. okay. So 1967, Jimmy brings up a a a. Uh, lawsuit against the police, I believe of Detroit, uh, who says that he was like beaten brutally by them and left in his car. God. So after investigation and witnesses and stuff, it turns out he was drunk behind the wheel, got pulled over by a cop, but literally got out of his car and fell over and hit his head on a rock. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> but then the cop didn't know what to do because he was famous. So he called two of his buddies and they just put him back in his car and left. Oh no. <laughs> So he did sue them, but it wasn't for police brutality. It was for like improper handling and procedure. Ugh, that makes sense. And it went on for years, this lawsuit. And he finally, I think, got paid out for $200,000. It's something. Or, or some, um, but yeah, that was just abuse, the uh, head, head injuries <laughs> and lawsuits. Uh, big noise at Winnecta, which is what uh, Floyd and Nigel did with the whistling number. Music by Haggart and Bowduck. The song actually was an accident. Uh, they were playing a gig and a bunch of their bandmates didn't come back on time from a break, but the this, this set had to start. So they went on and improvised. And this song is what came out of it. And they kind of played it that way in the, the sketch. like A little bit. They yeah, did. that's true. That's funny. Uh, that old black magic made popular by the film Star Spangled Rhythm. Uh, this was nominated for Best Original Song Oscar, uh, but it lost. No. No. Oh. <laughs> German, what did you think was the best Muppeteering moment this week? I had to say it was simple, but yet probably difficult to execute. But the Fozzie and Ralph piano duet, I think, was just really well done. And it was just so cute and uh, just a good encapsulation of Muppet feelings of them two just kind of working together. And Ralph totally accepting of Fozzie playing with him and them getting better and better than the funny falling over at the end. But it's just like it was super cute and probably hard to do because they had to match up those fingers with the piano movements like they do all the time. And I just really enjoyed it. Yeah, I, I uh I, I put the exact same thing. Oh, you did? <laughs> yeah, Rolf and Fozzie at the piano. Um, that y- you, the further you get in the Muppets, the more rare it is that you get to see, um, like uh, Frank Oz and Jim interact where it's not Kermit and Fozzie. The Kermit and Fozzie is always the pairing. Ah, uh, yeah, gotcha. it's always the interaction. So to get to see Fozzie interact with another one of Jim's characters in a major way. Is something that's a little rare. Oh, uh, okay. And so because of that, it's extra endearing to me. Yeah, that is nice. And it's very rare that you get two double hand puppets in the same set. Because all that coordination is pretty tough. 
Right. That's that's four puppeteers minimum. Yeah. Um, so that just in that way, in my mind, it's kind of a special, a special thing that happened. Gotcha. It makes me like it even more. That's right. <laughs> so, Darren, what happened on this week's episode of Star Trek, the original series? So this week we have a, a piece of the action, which is rated as uh, one of the top 10 episodes of the original series to watch, actually. And there's reasons for that we'll get into later. Um, so we have the Enterprise heading to Sigma Yosha 2. And apparently 100 years ago, the spaceship Horizon went missing there. So they're out to investigate. And when they get there, they get a radio signal and they contact a Bella Akmix. I think that's a pronounced name or Akmix. Yeah, it was weird. That's spelled very strangely. All uh, the names are weird. Yeah. And he's an Iotian on the planet who claims to be the boss. And he says to go ahead and meet him on the planet and he'll tell Kirk about what happened with the Horizon. Um, Spock says they should be careful not to contaminate the culture on the planet, but Kirk says they already screwed that up with the horizon 100 years ago, so they can't be hurting anything now. So Kirk, Spock and Bones beam down to the planet and it looks like they found this 1920s Chicago like planet. Basically, everything looks like 1920s Chicago and everyone's carrying Tommy guns and dressed like gangsters. And they're confronted by Bella's men at gunpoint and taken to his headquarters. And on the way there, they are shot up by a drive by by one of um, the opposing gang mobsters. And one of Bella's men is killed. But this seems totally normal to Bella's henchmen. He's like, that's just the way things are here. So they get to Bella's headquarters and Bella's playing pool and chatting them up. And Spock discovers a book called uh, Chicago Mobs of the 20s. And it was published in 1992. And he finally figures out that it must have been left there by the crew of the Horizon over 100 years ago. And that the Iotians must have built their society off it because apparently they're very smart and very impressionable is what they say multiple times this episode. <laughs> um, so Bella demands that Kirk and the Enterprise supply him with their fancy new heaters or the phasers and and some men so that he can take over the entire Iotian planet. Kirk obviously refuses and Bella takes them hostage and he uses the communicator to talk to Scotty back at the Enterprise and he makes his demands to Scotty or that he'll kill Kirk, Bones and Spock. Uh, while they're being held in a little holding room, Kirk distracts the guards who are holding him because they're all playing a game of poker. And he says, oh, I got a new game to play. It's what real men play. It's called Fizzbin. And he just it uses he makes up rules in the spot and just basically fools them all into paying attention to him while they knock them out and um, use the Vulcan nerve pinch on one of them. So he tells Spock and Bones to go to a radio station to contact the Enterprise. And Kirk goes off to do something. I'm not remember exactly what, but he gets captured by the rival mob boss's men. And this new mob boss named Krako uh, makes the same demands of Kirk that Bella did. But he offers him a piece of the action. Roll credits. <laughs> so uh, he gets, offers him a third of whatever profits they make once Krako takes over as the head mob boss. But Kirk refuses again and again. He's taken captive. So meanwhile, Bella contacts the Enterprise again and tells him that Kirk has been captured. And he says he'll help get Kirk back if they reconsider his offer. Uh, so Spock and Bones, who have by this time returned to the ship, decide they have no choice but to try to trust Bella. So they beam back down to his headquarters. And he, of course, immediately captures the gem and double crosses them. But Kirk has managed to escape from Krakow's men. And he gets back to Bella's headquarters just in time to save Bones and Spock. And by now he's gone full method acting and he's become a stereotypical Chicago mob boss guy. And his personality and his accent, it's really kind of funny to watch. And he makes he gets the outfits of two of the gangsters there. And Kirk and Spock put on some 1920s gangster gear and they leave Bones behind to watch Bella and his men while they go off to try to get Krako. So they obtain the help of a local street urchin, which is a quite a fun scene with this good little kid actor. And they distract Krako's guard so they can get into Krako's headquarters. And Kirk gets to Krakow and tells him that the Federation, yes, he is taking over the whole planet. And he says that Krakow helps him keep the peace. The Federation will give him a piece of the action. And Krakow agrees to this. But just to be safe, they beam Krakow aboard the Enterprise for the time being. Then they go back to Bella's headquarters and make him the same offer. And he accepts. And they arrange to have all the other mob bosses of the planet beam to Bella's headquarters to make them all agree to the deal. But right then, Krakow's men attack Bella's headquarters. And Kirk is able to use this communicator to tell Scotty to use the ship's phaser banks to stun everyone around the headquarters, instantly stopping the fight and scaring the rest of the mob bosses into the Federation deal. So Kirk tells them finally that he's installing Bella as the head boss with Krakow as his lieutenant and everyone else should fall in line. And that once a year, the Federation will come back to take a 40 percent piece of the action. 
So once back on the ship, Spock questions this deal that Kirk made with the Iotian people and how he will explain this weird situation to Starfleet. So Kirk actually apparently hadn't thought of this. You see him thinking for a bit and he's like, oh, yeah, I probably should come up with an explanation for this. He's like, oh, yeah. So we'll use the resources we get from the piece of the action so the Federation can make a fund to guide the Iotian people into a more ethical form of government and rule over the years. But just then, at the end, Bones realizes that he left his communicator at Bella's headquarters. So now the smart and impressionable Iotians will probably use this technology to change their whole society over the years. To which Kirk mm-hmm. says, now someday they're going to ask for a piece of our action. Womp womp. And then it womp ends womp in a womp. weird freeze frame, which is strange. That was weird. <laughs> yes. My guess is because someone laughed immediately after he said that and they had to freeze it because they didn't have any other footage to go off of. So right. that's what I'm assuming happened. But so, yeah, Steve, what did you think of a piece of the action? Um, things I liked uh, the time travel without it being time travel was kind of clever and I didn't mind it as much as I kind of thought I would. Right. Um, the card scene, the Fizbin scene was just great. <laughs> Um, I love it anytime Kirk is making something up because for whatever reason, Kirk sounds like he's doing a Shatner impression (laughs) when he's making stuff up. That'd be a a Royal fizz bin. What are the odds on that? He like kicks it up to a different level of Shatner when he as Kirk is pretending something. Well, you know, what's funny is that apparently the trivia is that, uh, Kirk made up the rules of fizz bin as he goes along. So William Shatner was actually ad libbing those rules. So his, his Unless looks it's dark on a Tuesday and the confusion from everyone around him is genuine because he was making it up on the spot, <laughs> which is pretty cool. Uh, and I agree the negotiation with the kid um, and his intro I th- was he, the kid was the first one to say a piece of the action, right? Yeah. I think he gets it from him. That was so normally it is so cliche and terrible when they put the name of the thing in, in the thing as a line. And for whatever reason, I did not hate this. Uh, yeah, because they made it work and make sense. Like they made it work, mm-hmm. um, and and sort of out of the mouths of the babes, it was much more forgivable for whatever reason. But I didn't hate that, and I thought that for whatever reason that was well done. Who are you calling a babe? <laughs> it's you, but not it's not personal. <laughs> uh, things I disliked, or maybe had a tougher time with. They so they really painted themselves into a corner with this one. The the last ship was there a hundred years ago before the non interference rules, mm-hmm. but just in the so we know that these non interference rules exist now, right? They exist, but we have seen multiple times on this show <laughs> where they interrupt and interfere with less advanced civilizations, and so it's weird that they defined it only to basically reveal that they didn't haven't cared about it. Oh, yeah. Like the prime directive, basically. Do not mess right. around they, with civilization. Just, is this the fr- this is the first kind of mention of something like that, I think. I feel like they have mentioned it in previous episodes, but they don't really follow it. No, that's uh, they're no, notorious it was, for it that. It was funny to watch them like paint themselves into a corner. I was like, oh, all right. Well, weird <laughs> choice, but OK. You're going to follow that from now on then? <laughs> um, there was a shot that didn't make any sense where a woman is sitting on this gangster's desk and she has a gun strapped to her leg. And I think they rotated it to make it more visually identifiable. But if she were to stand up, the gun would be like backwards and on the inside of her leg. <laughs> like, how the hell would she possibly utilize that? Gun? I didn't even notice that. Yeah, I sat and had to think and like reverse it in my head. I'm like, no, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> um, there was a shot where someone they just didn't piece it. They did not frame the shot correctly where Kirk is running and a guy stops him and he's like, you're coming with me. This could be a taxi or a hearse. You get what I'm saying? He's like, yeah, I think I get the picture, but the car wasn't in the frame and didn't pull into the frame for another like five seconds. So us as an audience had no context for what the hell the line was. It didn't make any sense for five to 10 seconds until the car showed up. Oh, well, I just said you're coming with me. And then he said it's going to be either a taxi or a hearse. I, I thought assumed there was a car he nearby. was referencing. If you listen to the if you listen to the line, he's like, this can be. And I was like, what's this? You guys are walking in an alleyway. <laughs> I didn't think of that either. Um, <laughs> didn't face so it. was just weird. Like it just someone goofed <laughs> a little bit and it didn't come together. right. <laughs> um, Kirk escaping from the two guards. May have been the dumbest thing on Star Trek so far. Which one? When he was in the room with the two guards and he like 
God, what did he do? He just punched one and the other one ran in and like tripped and he grabbed his jacket and threw it <laughs> over his head and then was able to rearrange the jacket and then punch the guy. Well, first he's the he said, he dumbest was, thing. They, they show him <laughs> setting up a, a tripwire and that's the whole point. <laughs> yeah, he was setting up a tripwire and the scene started. <laughs> so, that was so stupid. <laughs> so well, I didn't get the jacket part. You're right. Like he picks up this blanket or jacket or something and like. <gasps> What are you going to do with that? And the guy comes in and he kind of flops it around his head. I'm like, what? <laughs> it's like, why would you need like that? He flopped around his head and then thrown him into a wall. That would have been fine. But that's not what happened. It was weird. Um, and, and just, it got really shallow with like, how many times can, can Kirk punch a guy and Spock pinch him? Right. They used that four different occasions this episode <laughs> where they escaped trouble by Kirk punching a guy and Spock pinching him. Well, my upset was like right along with that is that my only complaint about this episode is they just do the same thing over and over again. They get caught. They get caught. They get caught. It's like make some better plans. You're in Starfleet. This, you know, and like this is my overall issue. I think echoes this is that someone had a really good premise and they didn't have enough plot to fill it. And you can feel it. Yeah. There is not enough plot to fill this episode. And it was actually moving at an OK pace. And then Kirk decided to become a gangster. And then that went on for way too long. <laughs> It'd be fine if Kirk was a gangster in the last five minutes to fix the situation. But it was like the last third of the episode. Well, the time that he was talking as a gangster was actually when things were happening. What, what wasted so much time was them getting caught and figuring a way out over and over again. I'm like, this was totally unnecessary. <laughs> Only to come back to then get caught again. <laughs> right. The scenes where he's actually talking to people and re- arranging things, that was fine. But it's just like, right. you're just it's getting just caught the- over and over again. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, I think you're um, right. There was some time filling going on there a little bit. Yeah. Once again, great premise, not enough plot, I think, is what this episode suffered from. That's fair. Uh, but overall, there are a lot of episodes I've liked less than this. It's good. Good middling episode then. Yeah. I think people move to the top 10 because of just the funny moments with Fizbin and the Kirk doing oh, the Chicago, Fizbin. the mob accent and stuff. And the kid, once again, the kid was great. The, yeah. The, that scene was great with the urchin. Daddy, so I hurt myself. Stuff. Daddy. <laughs> my boy, my boy. What'd they do to you? Sonny. <laughs> Sonny. <laughs> All right, so we got some uh, trivia for this episode. Um, yeah, there's a few fun ones here. So James Doohan, Scotty, he's a, a pretty renowned in his voices of ability. That's, he's actually Canadian. He does the Scottish accent this whole series, but he does a lot of voices. And later on, we does the animated series. He does a lot of the characters' voices for that. But he also provided the voice of the radio announcer they hear at the radio station uh, with like hmm. the, the 1920s radio announcer. That was James Doohan. Um, after filming wrapped, the studio received a letter from Anthony Caruso, who played Bella Oxminx, and it was a letter from him, his character Oxminx, thanking the crew for the, of the Enterprise for creating the syndicate and that things were proceeding nicely on Sigma Iosha 2. And as he goes on the letter, it is now the 1950s and he's sporting a crew cut. And he also mentioned wanting to visit Las Vegas, remarking, it seems like my kind of town. So like, yeah. he's a cool actor that he sent them a letter in character. Um, Marvel Comics published a sequel story to this episode as part of their Star Trek Unlimited series. The story is called A Piece of the Reaction, and it featured the crew of the USS Enterprise E, the the Enterprise from First Contact Forward, um, Mm -hmm. so with Picard and everything, returning to the planet to discover that its society had in fact gone on to model itself after 23rd century Starfleet, thanks to the communicator McCoy left behind. And the planet is now led by the tough kid star uh, Kirk and Spock met in the street. What? And he wishes to hide. He wants to hijack the Enterprise E and finally gain command of a starship, just like his idol, James T. Kirk, which I thought was really cool. I want to read that comic now. It's pretty neat. Um, And then Star Trek Enterprise episode Horizon. uh, It's a hardbound copy of a book beginning with the title Chicago Gangs can be seen briefly on a bookshelf in uh, Travis Mayweather's quarters. He's one of the, the main characters in the show. Um, when he's on board the ESC Horizon, which is the ship he's on, I think, before he gets on the Enterprise, um, suggesting that Mayweather had some connection to the group which contaminated the Iotian culture to begin with, which is really funny. So we might see a connection to that later on when we get to Enterprise in 14 years. Um, this is the only episode of uh, the original series that ends with a freeze frame, as we noticed. It was very odd. And this is the only time that happens. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, that was weird. So uh, what's our Trek connection Muppet connections Ooh. this week? Well, both William Shatner and J.P. Morgan were born in 1931. 
Oh, nice. Both Shatner and J.P. Morgan were featured on season three, episode 11 of the John Gary show in 1969. Oh, it wasn't nope. the love boat. Oh, no, that's love too boat. bad. Sorry. <laughs> 1969, a music variety show. I gotcha. The, that same episode also featured fellow Muppet show guest star Avery Schreiber. Ah, nice. Very nice. And a piece of the action features Vic Tabak, who played Jojo Krakow. Mm-hmm. He played the v- voice of the villainous Carface in All Dogs Go to Heaven. <laughs> the voice of Itchy in that movie was done by Dom DeLuise, <laughs> Muppet movie cameo haver and former Muppet show uh, guest. Nice. That's the uh, Trek connections. Some good ones. Some solid ones. Mm, delicious. So similarities for these very equal episodes. I have <laughs> uh, Scooter, J.P. Morgan, Statler and Waldorf and the Swedish chef are all surprised by a bomb. Just like Kirk, Spock and Bones are all surprised over and over again by being double crossed by the mobsters. <laughs> How could they have pulled it off? Ooh. How can you not trust guys with Tommy guns? <laughs> Uh, both involve people randomly striking things or people. Animal trying to club the bee and Kirk punching everyone. <laughs> Even a woman in last episode. <laughs> Man, at least there wasn't anything that abrupt. <laughs> that was amazing. Okay, both uh, J.P. Morgan and Kermit teleport back and forth with their explosions. Just like the characters of the episode in Star Trek where they teleport back and forth. And that's pretty pivotal to the episode, the teleporting going on. Uh, both feature gangster style fedoras. Uh, the gangsters and jp morgan during the talk spot in that ridiculous hat that's true that's true i can see that <laughs> oh god <gasps> what's that noise transporter now, transporter now function it's now the time of the episode where we transport one character from one episode to the other and vice versa what you got for us steve this week muppets to trek i've got link hogthrob coming over to take kirk spot mostly because i would love to see link hogthrob in a zoot suit doing a bunch of gangster talk i think he could do it he could pull it off the action (laughs) (laughs) i have bella oxminx to replace jp gross uh i feel like he would pull it off really well he'd be a little more charismatic but yeah he could do a good job i could absolutely see that (laughs) Uh, i said jojo cracko Coming over to take Uncle JP's spot, <laughs> terrorizing the backstage and assessing how what percentage he's going to get of the Muppet show. <laughs> Either one would work very well. Yes. Yeah. I have uh, JP Morgan to replace Kirk. Uh, I think okay. she's very charismatic and snarky, and she'd be especially good for as Kirk in this particular episode because she'd be funny in character as a mobster and stuff. I think she'd do a good job. All right, I can see that a little bit gruffer. Yeah, I like it. All right. All right I like it. Well, I guess that brings us to the end of episode 46 of the Muppet Trek podcast. Join us next time for Muppet Show with special guest Zero Mostel. An original series episode, The Immunity Syndrome. And from the lovers, the dreamers, and us. Live long and prosper, everyone. Thanks for listening to the Muppet Trek podcast. Be sure to follow us on social media on Facebook and Twitter. Subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform. This podcast has been brought to you by A Play on Nerds. 